fast and afterwards we will have a book signing in the back of the room so please Thank you so much. Uh, it's nice to be here and it's nice to see so many of you. Uh, as Anatol was saying, we're going to have a uh, conversation today about two, in some ways, quite different books, but at the same time, books with quite a lot of similarities. And uh, both of you, both you, Bart, and uh, you, Elizabeth, you've been uh, writing... Uh, these books, uh, The Cutout Girl, uh, it's translated as Jenta med minneboken in Norwegian, and Elizabeth, uh, For Lattheten, The Abandonment. Um, and you've both been, in a sense, tracing both your own family histories and, in a sense, European history as well, if we might say uh, that. And I was wondering what... Perhaps, but since your book was published first, uh, what prompted you to write this book? What, because you did not trace your own Jewish family in a sense, or in a way no. you did. <laughs> yes, but I'd, I'd always been vaguely aware of the fact that my grandparents on my father's side had harboured Jews during the war and that there had been this Jewish girl who not only had been hidden with them during the war, but had continued to live with them after the war, that my father had grown up with her as a kind of sister. She was there in family photographs, like their wedding. But that was as far as it went. This person was never spoken about, and she wasn't around anymore. So it, it was something that was kind of both present and yet awkwardly absent. And I generally had a kind of vague sense that I, as somebody who worked in history, should investigate this. But it wasn't until really very late in the day, in 2014, that something sparked me to start investigating it. And, and I think looking back, though it wasn't that obvious to me at the time, it was a combination of really sort of three things. Um, it was the death of my eldest uncle, Case, um, who, whose death sort of showed me that this generation and its stories were were dying away, and that if I didn't investigate it now, um, it would be gone forever. Um, secondly, I think a sense of uh, a return of feelings that had, had felt to me largely suppressed during the last sort of 70 or so years, um, that I, I felt that lessons had been learned from World War II, and now suddenly again, one was hearing anti-Jewish conspiracy theories, Islamic State was on the rise of the kind of post-truthness starting then that's only become worse since. So this, this rise of a new kind of fascism, an explicit fascism, was, was, was there again. And the final thing was that I was actually working on childhood in my specialism of Renaissance literature uh, and working on, on actually you know, the quite distressing subject of, of child abuse in uh, early modern England. Mm -hmm. And that sort of struck me as this continual vulnerability of children. Mm. And that made me sort of say, you know, yes, I've got to go and investigate that. And that's how I ended up in late 2014 in a room with this woman who'd been my father's sister, but who I, I had no memory of having met. And, you know, I ended up with her for the whole of that day because of this story that started coming out. Mm. Now... Elizabeth, you also, in a sense, started investigating, mm -hmm. right? But you investigated in a different way because you have investigated uh, your own family history in a different way than what Bart has done. Yes, well, it was striking when I read Bart's book, which I really, really like, love, you should read it, um, is the title, The Cutout Girl, because, of course... It has a specific meaning for the person you write about, Lean, but it actually is exactly what I have grown up to feel, although I was never put in another home or another family or, or going through that kind of experiences. But I grew up in the sense of being in an island, an isolated island, not having connections in time or in in the geographical sense. So it was just very, very isolated. And I couldn't understand that. And so I had to get this old, as I am today, to start uh, to look at that from the outside and wanted, wanting to understand how come. And in order to understand myself, I had to look at my mother. 
how did she become what she is? Uh, and in order to understand her, I had to go back for another generation. So yes, it's been a lifelong project, and yet I've only been working with it for the last couple of years. Uh, and um, I mean, this is what I do. I, I try to trace the sense of this isolation, loneliness, abandonment. Mm. Mm. And this is, of course, um, something that you trace very much in your book as well. Now, your book, Bart, is a biography, right? More, uh, you've written a novel, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, you've written a, a, a biography tracing this uh, woman that you say you met her uh, into her 80s and mm. uh, developed a friendship with her. Uh, but she was... Uh, she, she ended up with your family because she was uh, in hiding, right, from... Uh, yeah. uh, from the Nazis, and uh, in a sense, she's like uh, we we know this story in a in a way, right? Because we read Anne Frank, we, we we've read, uh, we've heard about this uh, endeavor to sort of escape uh, uh, escape uh, the Nazis. But this is this this was a story that was not known, as you said. And Lean, she was sent to your... Lean is the, is the name of uh, the girl in your book, and she was sent to your grandparents when she was eight, almost nine years old. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a very difficult label, biography, whether you call this a biography or not. Um, it's... I, I tend to think of it as a piece of creative nonfiction. Uh, that that there's a lot of filling in of gaps uh, that was necessary. But the, the basic story is that, you know... Lean grew up in The Hague in the 1930s uh, with Jewish parents who didn't really particularly think of themselves as Jewish. Um, but then with the invasion of the Netherlands uh, in 1940, um, very quickly kind of restrictive measures came in. And the Netherlands was one of the first countries really to be systematically cleared of its Jews and uh, that process happened very rapidly over the course of 1942. And in July 1942, there were already very large numbers of summonses to uh, uh, send uh, people to Auschwitz. And her parents took this decision that, that was taken by about 4,000 uh, Jewish mothers who, who thought that their children could survive if they gave them away. Uh, and this incredibly painful decision uh, that they decided to hand over their daughter to the resistance. Uh, so a resistance member came to the door, collected Lean. She very vividly remembers that journey uh, to another part of the country where she was given a new identity as uh, the niece of my grandparents. And the initial plan was that she would just be able to exist there uh, under this new identity, which actually didn't work out. And she instead ended up being... Uh, after a police raid on that house, parceled across uh, a series of nine families over the course of the war. Uh, so the, the story ended up being far more complicated than I'd realised um, at the beginning. And actually it also required, and this is where I slightly would challenge that category biography, um, her recall of things at the beginning of her life uh, was very good. She still remembered the train journey, still remembered the first meals she had with my grandparents. But as she was passed between more and more families, even though she got older, her memories become vaguer and the gaps become more extreme. And suddenly there are whole periods of half a year in which she can recall absolutely nothing. So what I ended up doing was traveling to all these places where she'd lived in hiding um, and finding evidence there of what happened to her. Uh, so this, the process became sort of oddly dialogic where I would give her her past and she would respond to it and then we had to kind of reconstruct it together, um, not entirely from direct memory but from, from evidence. Mm. And she is saying at some point that uh, um, you're writing writing it the way it could have been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, I think she was... That's the first episode that she was really troubled by in an, in an interesting way was when she'd already moved to a second address. She'd lived in much more of an Anne Frank-style hiding mm. then for about uh, 
six or seven months in, in a back room, and then there was a second police raid there. And I, she remembered being taken to another resistance household, being carried by um, a boy. Um, and I described that um, in a sort of novelized way, but, but based on that testimony. Uh, and yeah, she sort of said that she found that a sort of disorienting experience, really, because she said it, it feels too active, mm -hmm. the way you've described it. I just have this sense that these things happen to me. Um, and in that case, it's actually interesting that the, the children of that boy ended up contacting us, and we now know lots more about what happened than we did then. So again, it's been this, this quite interesting kind of corroborative thing. Mm. She met up with those children, uh, so that's been, been quite moving mm. for her. So it is this jigsaw puzzle, in a sense, yeah, that you've yeah. been... Uh, and you say, quite early on in your book, you say, you, you, you have a statement, you make a statement that is really interesting, where you say, it was Hitler who made Lynn Jewish. Yeah. Yeah, and that's really something of, of many, many of the wisdoms in the book are just pretty much stolen from Lean. And she, she told me that early on, that you know, it was Hitler who made her Jewish. Uh, she, she didn't really have a sense of Jewish identity. You know, her, her parents seemed to be part of, and again, this is another big theme of the book, the way in which the Netherlands on the surface looked like an entirely integrated society in which Jews had more rights, really, than historically it had more rights than you know, any other country, really, uh, in the world. Um, and, you know, that they thought of themselves entirely as Dutch. Her childhood was dominated not by Jewish festivals, but by things like St. Nicholas uh, mm -hmm. and so on. And then this process through which the Nazis kind of isolated that group uh, to the extent that actually, you know, the Dutch population also, in a lot of ways, started... Um, distancing themselves from their Jewish neighbors and then more frighteningly still informing on them. And she, she remembers, you know, in, the, in, in 1942 that children in the street would throw stones at her, mm. uh, which is very shocking to me as somebody who'd kind of grown up with this myth of Dutch resistance. That the, the only story the Dutch tell themselves is that Anne Frank story mm. of the brave Dutch protecting the Jews against the invading Germans. And then, you, I mean, this, again, my, my ignorance on these matters was partly you know, a good thing for the book in that, you know, I learned that, you know, Dutch police officers had a unique bounty system where Dutch police officers were paid seven guilders and 50 cents for every Jew that they delivered. It was entirely the Dutch police force that rounded up the Jews. It was entirely the Dutch civil service that administered this system. Um, so, so yeah, this sort of, sort of it, it, it is partly a biography of Lean, but it's also a kind of a reckoning with... Uh, you know, the very kind of compromised nature of, uh, of Dutch collaboration. Mm. Now, in a sense, Elizabeth, your, your novel is as well, in, a, in some ways, it is... Um, you, you start out also, in a sense, with a, a family, uh, people who are not necessarily defining themselves as... Jewish, or where that is the most important? No, definitely part. not. No, well, you see, um, this sentence has been s said that Hitler made me a Jew. It's, it's, uh, it's the sentence of my family and of my father, and of course, uh, it's um, made me into the writer and person I am because this is, th this is the fate of European Jews in such great extent. Uh, but what I do in this book, because I tell the story of my father in another book, but this is the story of my, fam my mother's family. And there I grow up, and the first sentence, I'm not sure what it is actually in the Norwegian translation, but the, the first sentence in Swedish is, Jag föddes flykt beredd. I was born ready to flight, right? Prone to flight. So, and in that sentence, I try to capture the theme of the book because I'm born in Sweden in 1965. It's a safe country. It's a safe part of the world. There's no reason for me to feel prepared to have a packed bag and, you know, my passport ready. But I have inherited this experience of not being safe. And 
you don't have to have the Holocaust in your family story to have that uh, baggage, as we call it. Uh, it is, it's a story of many refugees today as well. They're all around us. Uh, the trauma of not being safe, of being abandoned in, in a sense. So that's where I start. Mm. Why am I ready to, to escape? Why am I living ready to escape? So there we go. And on the... And then the, the book is in three parts, as I said, and, and they're also, they, they are motivated of different uh, ideas. The first part about Rita, my grandmother in London, is uh, 10 years ago I went to Kew Gardens National Archives in London and, and started looking for family papers there, you know, birth certificate, death certificates, all that kind of basic stuff. And I found my grandparents' marriage certificate. And I had a quick look, put it at the side. And then later, I looked at it again, and I noticed the year when my grandparents got married, 1949. My mother was 20 years old when they got married. And I called her. She was in Stockholm. I was in London. I called her and said, do you know, do you know when your parents got married? And when I told her, she laughed for 10 minutes in pure shock. So we have this huge secret that they had pretended to be married for 20 years. They've had two children, but they were illeg illegitimate. That's sorry, my English is <laughs> slow today. And uh, how come? And what did that, what, how did my grandmother experience this? And why? And what did that make? What did that, uh, how did that affect my mother? Uh, so there is this, one of the secrets that has to do with the, well, the world history. Sometimes I don't feel like a writer. I feel like a seamstress. Mm. You know, I have, I have the past and I have the present and I try with my words to, to patch them together. Well, that is, of course, a text. It's weaving, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but this this story that you're telling, and also, uh, I mean, the secret behind your parents' uh, marriage and so on, it has to do with your grandfather, right? Who is then, he is a Sephardic He's a Jew. He was a yeah. Spanish Jew, yes. Yeah. It, well, this is what I do. I trace the past in order to understand the present, and I actually have to back into the Spanish Inquisition Sounds ridiculous, I'm, but, but that's where it took me to a uh, hundred years of unsafety for the Spanish Jews. And when we talk about Jews in Europe, um, we most of the time talk, we think about German Jews or Dutch Jews or Polish or Russian Jews, but there's actually a whole group, the Sephardic group, which is not as well known because the Nazis uh, erased them. Uh, but my grandfather happened to be one of them, a Spanish Jew, and they were expelled from Spain in 1492. After 100 years of persecution, they were finally expelled. Um, and just as a little by story, you know, uh, Christopher Colombo, when he was sent out to do his big, uh, uh, his big travels, he couldn't leave Spain from the major ports. He had to choose a very small city called Palo, because all the major ports were full of re Jewish refugees trying to leave the country or else they would be murdered. Uh, so my, my uh, forefathers, they spoke Spanish in an old Castilian dialect, the same language that Cervantes used when he wrote Don Quixote. And they took their refuge in the Ottoman Empire. So my family ended up in a city called Salonika, now called Thessaloniki, when it became Greek. And my grandfather emigrated from Thessaloniki to London, where he met my German grandmother. So it's a European mess. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, hmm. But it is also, of course, this, this European mess, in a sense, is also the story of uh, how 
we keep forgetting or how we keep erasing, right? And like you were saying uh, about this complicitness mm. of Dutch police, I mean, this is also uh, something that we have been dealing with in Norway, right, in terms of uh, how, how we've had huge debates about this. Mm. How do the stories we tell ourselves as a society about what we did during the war, because the, 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 for us, uh, Northern Europeans, Scandinavians, I mean, the war is still the Second World War, right? That is the Great War. And yeah. the stories we tell as a society, uh, the stories that feed our identity, our sense of nobility and uh, human kindness and so on, we hate it when those stories are being questioned. Uh, and this is something that you deal with in your book as well. I mean, you talk in, in particular, you have a story about one of the police officers in your book who is almost in a sense like the, a symbol of what is going on the, in the German, uh, sorry, in the Dutch society. Yeah, um, this is a particular individual called, called Harry Avers, who was one of the three main police officers in the town of Dordrecht, where Lean was hidden to uh, carry out the uh, capture of its 300 Jews, um, pretty much all of whom uh, ended up um, in the death camps. And, yeah, in a way, he's a sort of mini story of, of that kind of Dutch attempt to kind of reinvent yourself. I mean, I don't want it to be too much of a kind of general indictment on the Dutch because it's also a story of you know, incredible resistance, bravery, and I think, by and large, more a story of people who didn't really know what they could do to help and who sort of passed by on the other side. But there was a significant element of very active collaboration and a scary degree to which the kind of systems as a whole failed to allow people to do anything at, at level of conscience. So Harry Avers, um, you know, was just a random bully and thug who um, had actually been relatively Dutch nationalist, but who felt once the country had been conquered by the Germans in four days, that this was the new reality. The Germans were steamrolling into Russia. It was obvious who was going to win to him, so he joined the winning side and joined the Dutch police. And he joined, I think, the political police, which was the, the unit responsible for tracking down the Jews, mainly because of the huge amounts of cash that were available that he could steal from people's houses and the opportunity to rape huge numbers of Jewish girls uh, who he would take uh, um, before sending them away into his office. Um, and, you know, he's, he's, he's an absolute monster who then, in the latter stages of the war, managed to reinvent himself as a resistance hero. Um, so in the last part of the war, he started reaching out to some of these uh, nationalist contacts that he'd had at the beginning of the war when he'd actually been quite anti-German. Um, and started helping those people, providing them with weapons, uh, in a number of cases actually assassinating collaborators. So when the war ended, um, there were actually stories in the, in the local press about this, this heroic uh, policeman who'd been helping the resistance all along. And all his life he continued to maintain this myth. Um, and he felt, he claimed, completely outraged at the fact that he was eventually sentenced to eight years in prison for basically killing 300 people. Mm. And this is also, I mean, <laughs> uh, this, this is, this is uh, something that when I read it, I mean, uh, you see parallels to our society, but also, like you were saying, this, this isn't something that we think of when we think of the sort of Dutch uh, no. war uh, resistance and so on. And... I was also struck when I read your book, Elizabeth, that uh, when I read about this, uh, uh, when you describe uh, Salonika or Thessaloniki, mm. when you describe uh, the community that was there, when you describe it was a Jewish city in many ways. It was uh, a Muslim, Jewish and, uh, and uh, Christian. Christian city. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it opened up something 
about Europe and about sort of coexistence and history that I really didn't know very well. Mm. And then at the same time, you also tell the heartbreaking, horrible stories of what, how easy it seemed to be to erase the memory. Yes, well, here we have the connections between two books that seem to be very different, but, but I think there are a lot of connections because, yes, the, the story of... I mean, there's a story of my family and about how to erase things within the family and keep them secret or, or hide them. But then there's the story of history and the war and, and hiding and keeping things secret and, and deliberately keeping them in the dark. And uh, this is one example, as you say. I, um, in the book, the third part, the grown-up person who is very much like myself, my same age, uh, called Catherine, like I happen to be named as well, goes to Thessaloniki today, present time, to find uh, traces of her grandfather's childhood city and growing up there. And uh, a part of this was uh, this, there was a huge cemetery there, a Sephardic cemetery with graves from the very early days of Sephardic Jews. And it was huge. And the Sephardic Jews bury their people in a little different way than the Ashkenazi Jews. The Ashkenazi have the tradition of standing headstones, much like the Christian graves have. But the Sephardic Jews have lying headstones that cover the whole grave, big marble stones. So there was this huge cemetery in the middle of the city. And um, when the Nazis occupied Thessaloniki uh, or Greece, the Greek authorities asked the Nazis to erase the Jewish cemetery. Uh, this is found out by uh, local and, and historians. This is not my research, but I refer to it. And what happened with all this marble was uh, that it got used after the war when they wanted to repair their city and to rebuild it. So walking around there just a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, there are Jewish gravestones, and they can be my ancestors with the name Koenka on them, or Maisa, which are my family names. Uh, they're on the pavement, they're in playgrounds, they are used to, to the square outside the theatre, down by the harbour, a very popular theatre, when you walk out to have a, a drink or a glass or a cigarette in the pause in the theatre, you walk on Jewish gravestones. And maybe the most painful thing of all for me, I think, was all the churches uh, renovated with Jewish headstones. So you walk into a church and on the floor you walk on Jewish headstones, turned down. And this is sort of a symbol, not only, it's, it's first it's reality and fact, not metaphorical at all, but it's also a metaphor for what we are doing and, and what we are working with as writers, I think, when it comes to European World War II history. Europe is full of these headstones, metaphorically headstones, turned down. Names, year of birth, year of death, turned down. And we're some writers, historians, uh, who try to sort of turn, turn them over one by one. And, um, yeah, that's yeah. what... That, yeah. that profound, just to jump in for a moment, mm. that, that profound sense in which the metaphors just force themselves on you is something I really experienced while, while writing my book as well. Um, you know, the Netherlands is so obviously flat, and it's the one thing everybody knows about it, and it seemed to me kind of a country without history. It looks so new and shiny. You, you sort of everywhere gets renovated, and the roads are all straight. And I'd always sort of thought of it a bit as a country without a history. Mm. And then as I was working on my book, there are just these chasms that open up mm. under your feet. Mm. And the most striking example of that is, is the bit that happens sort of late on in my book, where I heard that Lean in the final part of the war was actually hiding in, 
the village that was my mother's home village. So she started out in my father's hometown. Right at the end of the war, her ninth place of hiding was my mother's home village. And I went to go and visit this house where she'd been hidden. Um, and this was five minutes away from my grandmother's house in the, in, the, in the village that I spent every summer. And I knocked on the door, and very quickly this woman said, oh, you were here at the t you, she was here at the time of Mrs. Van La. And I said, yes, do you, know, do you have a personal connection? She said, no, but we found a diary of hers when we expanded the cellar. And then she said, you ought to go and speak to my neighbor. He knows more about the war. I went there, and he said... Lintje, that's her name. She's the reason that I was born. Mm. And it was a sort of unbelievable <laughs> sense. And he said, we had Jews hidden here under the floor. Um, and actually, there were eight Jewish families hidden under the floorboards in this street. And it became clear that there were 150 Jews hidden in this tiny little village um, in various places. I came home and told my aunt and uncle this, with whom I was staying, who've lived in that village all their lives. They said, no, that's impossible. We don't believe that. We've never heard of that. Um, and I said, well, you know, it's true. There, there are these places. And that is the extent of the, 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 the emptying of the past. I mean, this is a, actually a village with an extraordinary resistance record. But the resistance record wasn't talked about mm -hmm. because there's also a collaboration record. And after the war... It's just like, we were all kind of the same. We were all in the resistance, so there's not a monument. There's <laughs> nothing. It's flat. And, you know, and it's not flat. You know, it's full of these horrific holes. But you actually then, like you said, I mean, this is, it's, it's such a fascinating story that you went back, you found uh, Lean, but you didn't find her sort of just in documents and in records, you actually met her, you befriended her. I mean, you yeah. became close friends. Yeah, and we still are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah which was an incredible privilege. Um, and I, I was very lucky to meet Lean at a stage in life where she had finally kind of repaired herself to a very mm. significant extent. So the person I met in 2014 was, you know, this very kind of modern, interested, vibrant person, you know, still one of my best friends. Um, but she has actually needed a lifetime to reconstruct herself, you know, just as Elizabeth sort of talks about this way that the trauma lives with people. Mm. Um, so she was a kind of perfect interlocutor because um, she had this experience of trauma, but she had also been able to sort of put it at a distance from herself. Um, which meant that she sort of actually rather enjoyed the process and it wasn't mm. one of continual horrific confrontation. She actually, ultimately, when she started trusting me, um, which was actually quite quick, she was very decisive, um, she um, said, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this process of reconstruction. Mm. Um, and and it, it, she says, you know, it's been a, um, a fulfillment of her mm. life. She says it's an enrichment, mm. uh, which, is, which is really very, very... Uh, nice to have been able to do that with somebody. But you also say, uh, wh when you started to get to know her, you, you I'm, I'm not sure if I remember this completely correctly, but you say something uh, uh, to the extent of you almost got to know her as a child. It was as if you were her senior. Yeah. Yeah, you get this sort of odd palimpsest of sort of things in the past and things in the present overlapping. And because I had no kind of history with her, you know, I just went to her house in, at 10 in the morning and she kind of interviewed me for uh, an hour or so saying, you know, why have you come here? You know, what kind of books do you write? Uh, you know, tell me about your father. Tell me about your relationships with your, with your children. And then she said, you know, I totally trust it. And then she said, oh, you can ask me anything you want to. And... So I sort of hit upon this way of working with her, which was just, you know, tell me your very first memories. You know, what do you remember of your parents? What clothes did you wear when you were a child? Um, what food did you eat? Uh, and we just carried on like that. You know, we, we just didn't talk. I didn't kind of know where the story was heading. And I would just ask her questions endlessly until we exhausted a subject. And then I would go out and investigate it and, and come back. So we... So I kept, because these were such intense conversations, um, you know, I had ultimately about 40 hours of taped interviews and a lot of time in addition to that. Um, 
yeah, I was experiencing her as a little girl. And as I was writing the book, it was almost a sort of out of bodily experience because for those sections where I'm in her, I'm sort of seeing the world kind of as an eight-year-old girl would. And I feel like, I actually said to her, I feel that I know you better than I know anybody, mm -hmm. um, better than I know my wife. or Because you don't do that with anybody normally. Mm. You don't say, tell me everything about mm. yourself. Mm. And she was totally trusting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I recognize this from when I wrote this book that was mentioned, the, and in Wienerwald, the trees are still standing, mm. because there I described this young Jewish boy who wasn't alive when I wrote about him, so I never met him in person, but I got to know him through all these letters from his parents in Vienna uh, sent to him in Sweden. And it ended up with me telling his grandchildren uh, what he'd done when he was a child. So I was like a medium <laughs> from, from his, uh, yeah, from, from ages ago to mm. his present grandchildren. So that's a very interesting process. And, mm. Um, mm. Mm. and this time, of course, you're, you're telling the story, as you've uh, said, it, of yourself, of your family, but like we've uh, heard also... Uh, the story of Sephardic Jews going back to the 14th century. Uh, and you were saying that, in a sense, you now met a woman who was, in a sense, uh, had come to terms with uh, events. And that is very different from your book, Elizabeth, because you are very... Uh, you express very clearly uh, a wrath, an mm. anger... Mm -hmm that is still there and that I think you, you, you wouldn't want to get rid of in any way. Well, not, we yet, not yet, in any way. No, well, it's, uh, what we're talking about again now is the third part. Mm. Uh, in the first part, my grandmother. Second part, my mother and child. And then the third part, a grown-up woman like myself going to Thessaloniki, and there this woman turns into a warrior. Mm. Um, a bit like Don Quixote, maybe, uh, because it's a hopeless war she's, she's uh, faring. But the thing is, all this is, of course, personal and deeply felt, but I have also thought a lot about the feelings surrounding Holocaust, uh, the way we talk about it, the way we uh, approach it, and there are some feelings that are accepted and that we use again and again as respect, of course, and sorrow and shame. And, and all these are, are the feelings that should be there. I, I'm not against them. But what I feel is anger, a very strong anger. And it's like that feeling is not one of the accepted uh, it's not in the, in the spectre of feelings surrounding Holocaust. And I think it's interesting because anger is, at the moment, one of the driving forces for very important changes in the world, like Black Lives Matter or Me Too. They're anger-driven movements to make the world better. And I don't understand why the Holocaust doesn't make us angry. It makes me really angry to think of the Sephardic fate, the, the Spanish Jews, it makes me angry to think of what happened to my father in Budapest or my grandfather who was murdered and his mother who was murdered. Uh, it makes me really angry reading your book uh, about the horrific things that people do mm. to each other and have to experience. So... Yes, it's a book that ends in like a crescendo of anger. And I won't expose the last words, the final words of it. But uh, and I think this is, it is interesting to think about anger. I had, I had the privilege of visiting South Africa just before um, the pandemic, talking about an earlier book on festivals there, 1947. And it was uh, a strange thing coming there with a book so European and also about the Holocaust and thinking, how, how should we meet each other in South Africa, meeting black and white South African writers? But actually, it wasn't at all difficult because this is a society 
that had this tremendous... Trem well, you know all about apartheid. I don't have to explain that. And then they suddenly went from one day to another to reconciliation. And there was no anger in between. And that means the anger is still so present in society there uh, now. So I, I, I think reconciliation is fine. <laughs> it's maybe a, even a goal, but anger has to come first. Mm. Now, you're also, uh, I think you make the point most explicitly, Bart, uh, talking about our own time mm -hmm. and sort of drawing some parallels. Uh, and you do as well, Elizabeth, this, uh, but not to the same extent. But you're saying that you're struck by some of the similarities of what you're writing about and the time we're in. Yeah, um, I mean, it's again that, that word palimpsest of sort of, you know, something that gets written over multiple times. Um, I felt that particularly strongly, for example, going to visit um, the house where my grandparents had lived um, in, in the town of Dordrecht, the first house that Lean uh, went to uh, when she'd uh, left her parents' house. And that area is now kind of absolutely exclusively Muslim. Uh, really. Um, and I went there and was sort of scanning the street to find this house, which actually had been demolished, um, and started sort of taking photographs of the places around the house in this now quite sort of, you know, run-down area where all you see is kind of halal butchers and kind of cheap mobile phone shops. And I was taking pictures of the house, and then the guy who, who owned the house came out and started sort of shouting at me, saying, why are you taking photographs of my house? You know, you ought not to be around here. And it's a sort of moment of cowardice on my part, really, that I just have to confront in the book, because I didn't tell this guy, look, I'm here investigating the Holocaust and looking at what happened to my aunt who hid here. As I was calling her my aunt by then, she kind of is my aunt. Um, you know, instead I said, oh, well, I'm doing something on the war, and then sort of just left. Um, and there's all sorts of sort of unwritten tensions there. When I was visiting white people, I felt quite happy saying, oh, I'm investigating the war. This house was a, uh, a hiding place because we had this sort of shared history. But with this Muslim community, I was sort of thinking, oh, that, that might not be welcome here, which is a kind of prejudiced assumption on my part. So there's a very complicated way in which the past is present there. You know, in certain ways, the Islamic community in the Netherlands is comparable to the Jewish community in the Netherlands during the war. I mean, they are being marginalized. There are marches against them. There are, um, you know, things being said by Khir Wilders and the like to say that, you know, Mohammed is a pedophile and that, um, you know, this, this, this community ought to be, uh, you know, wiped out uh, and sent back to where they came from. Um, so, you know, you see that, that rise in the far right, that sort of denial of the past. You also see, of course, anti-Semitism to some extent within the, Jew, the, the Muslim community. So these things are not straightforward, but, um, yeah, you have to all the time have this reflective sense of history. If you, if you don't share a history with people, then there's much more of a danger if you're getting kind of cut off. And the debates around anti-Semitism in the UK at the moment, I think, have been largely based on that kind of failure of empathy on the left in, in, in the UK. So you had people like Corbyn being so aggressively pro-Palestinian pro rights that he saw in no way that the Jewish community might feel rather threatened by this kind of language about Zionism and, and kind of links between, you know, the White House and, and the Jewish lobby. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's complicated, but vitally important that we think about the past and recover the past in order to understand where we are. Mm. And that's, of course, what you've both been doing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I've no idea how much time we have left. We have very little time okay. left, but I think we can... Well, I think this is actually the theme for a, a whole new talk mm. because I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with these I think it's I'm not saying that you do that but I think it's it's a problem when you draw the, the 
take the parallels too far. Yeah. Uh, we have both investigated the details of this time, uh, the Second World War, but I've also looked into the world after the World War, in this book, 1947, how the, our present time was being shaped after the war. And there, there are really huge differences between the 30s and 40s, the pre-war time, and our present. Huge differences. Uh, so I just think we should see the problems today for what they are, uh, because the solutions aren't the same. If we analyze them too much, from the point of view of the 30s and the Nazism, we won't find the right uh, solutions. Uh, the, it's a different scene today uh, in many ways. And um, as I said, we could talk for at least another hour about this. It's very, very important. Mm -hmm. But I, I just want to put up a little, you know, not, not making too much of the similarities because mm. there are huge differences. Mm. And one of the ways that we actually learn how to, how, how we recognize our own time is precisely by reading and listening and having the stories mm -hmm. uh, of as many people as possible with us and having the humanity of people with us uh, and taking for granted the humanity of people to avoid uh, the kind of histories you're well, talking at least, about. At least knowing where the gravestones lie. Exactly. Mm. Mm. And as you said, turning them over. And I'm very happy that you've both been doing this work and turning over some gravestones. And I know that uh, the names on those stones will stay with me for a very long time. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for this session and for giving us these stories. At Sølberge, we will keep your stories alive and giving them to a lot of people. And you can uh, borrow them from us or you can buy them from the back there and you can have signatures as well so thank you everyone for tonight it was very very nice thank you